But these are really amazing. It's, I'm going to do something that I've never done before in a 60 Symbols video. I'm going to invite you, Brady, to come to the toilet with me. Let's do it. So we're going to talk about 3D movies and how do 3D movies and 3D glasses work. What's the technology behind these things? I went to see Hugo, which is a wonderful, wonderful film before Christmas with my daughters. So how does it work? Well, it's based around, well, I guess the first question you've got to ask is, well, why do we have depth perception? How do we, how do, in the real world, do we get some sense of Brady so far away from me, I can sort of see that he's a solid object rather than a plane. Um, where do we get that from? And the key thing is we've got obviously got two eyes and they're separated by a certain distance. So both of these eyes see a slightly different scene. And your brain is unbelievably clever at taking those different scenes and bringing them together and giving you that depth perception. So the question then is how do you get something that's flat on a screen in a cinema or on a television and give you that depth perception? Well again, what you need to do is to have those, the, you're um, playing different scenes to different eyes. That's the key thing. But what you do is you have um, two cameras when you're filming um, the, the, the movie. One camera is filming what goes to the left eye, one camera is filming what goes to the right eye. And you bring those together and you have a slight offset, which is why um, when you take your glasses off, everything looks quite blurred um, on the screen. So the challenge at the cinema is, well, how do you take something on a flat screen and how do you deliver those two separate um, scenes each to one eye? How do, you, how, do you get the, 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 how do you trick the brain into thinking that scene has got real depth? And the way you do that, well, it used to be, you may remember, some of the slightly older viewers might remember, that you used to have red and blue glasses. You'd have these tinted things and you, through, in the 80s. I think it goes all the way back to maybe the, the, the 40s. Could be wrong there, but I think that, that sort of red and blue um, approach has been around a long time. And what are they doing now? Well, what they do is they basically have red and blue filters. They take the, the, the film that one camera has shot and they take the film that the other camera has shot one of which has a blue tint, the other which has a red tint, and then they use blue and red um, filters to separate those out. So the, the one that's got the red tint will come to the, 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 the red eye, as it were, and the one that's got the blue tint will go to the blue eye. Yeah, we've moved on, and the problem with red and blue, obviously, is that you're playing with the colours, you're losing colour definition, they look washed out. The depth perception isn't as good, actually, with the, with the, with the colours, and um, it's very problematic in terms of, of getting a nice, high-definition movie. So what do we do now? Well, actually, what we do is we play with something called the polarisation of light. You've come across polarisation, you've come across Polaroid before. And Polaroid is basically a thin film, I've got some of it here. And in that thin film are lots and lots of polymer molecules, long chain molecules that are stretched in a particular direction. And so I'm sure you've seen this before. If we take a piece of polymer, unfortunately it's a bit, I've just broken it. We'll do it this way. Um, you go take a piece of, po of Polaroid film, if you match them up like that, you can roughly see through it, I guess. And then when we turn it together, turn it, turn it round through 90 degrees, it blocks the light. Why does it do that? OK, so we've got to go back, I'm afraid, to undergraduate physics, A-level physics, uh, high school physics. This is going to be tricky to explain at, um, at uh, a non-scientific level. But light's a wave. Let's start with that. Other times it behaves like particles, but for the purposes of this, we're going to take that light as a wave. So light is a wave. And what is it a wave of? Well, it's, what it is is an electromagnetic wave. It's an electric field and a magnetic field. We're going to concentrate here only on the electric field because that's all really that matters. So this thing, light's propagating like that in that direction. Now it's got, we call it an electric field vector. And what that basically is, is tells us which direction the electric field's pointing. So in this case, it's propagating that way and the electric field's pointing that way. If we turn it around like that, it's propagating that way and the electric field's pointing that way. Turn it around like that, the electric field's pointing that way. And of course, this is going back and forth gazillions of times a second, to use the technical term. That's all you really need to know. You've got this, this characteristic of the wave which tells you basically in which plane it's vibrating. So what the Polaroid does is when you've got, you've got the lights, you've got all the, 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 the light that's in this room and that light is, is basically unpolarized. Right? That means that, that, that it's, it's, you've got some light waves which are like that, some which are like that, some which are like that, some which are like that. All a wide range of different polarizations. So if all the light in this room wasn't um, 
uh, or random, but it was actually going in one direction, then what you'd have is if you align your Polaroid in the direction of the, the ETH of the electric field, um, then what you find is that the light can get through very simply. However, if you rotate it round, just like I did with the Polaroid before them, it doesn't get through. And that's a very, very useful property of light and of certain materials like Polaroid. So when I went to see Hugo, what, what happens is that you use um, these glasses. So in one side, the simplest version of these um, is that on one side we have a Polaroid, basically which is aligned like this. And on the other side, we have a polarizer, polaroid film, which is aligned like this. So what happens is that you take those two um, uh, different versions of the movie, which are filmed in different cameras, and you polarize. You put a polarizer in for each one of those cameras, as it were. And that means that the light coming from the screen associated with the left eye, say, is polarized this way. And the light coming from the screen associated with the right eye is polarized this way. And then you put these on. And now, bingo, you've got a way of differentiating, distinguishing between what should be going to the left eye and what should be going to the right eye. It's very clever. You're, yeah, you're watching two movies at once with slightly different scenes, and then you are using the polarization of the light coming from the screen to, to trick your brain into thinking, well, okay, what I'm seeing here is, is real life, and therefore it must have a depth. I told a little fib, it isn't really linear polarization here. What we actually have with these glasses and many of these glasses is something called circular polarization. There, instead of this electric field being in the plane like this, it rotates round. So it's rotating like this or in the other direction. It can be rotating like this. And we call that left and right circularly polarized light. Because if you look, if you imagine my fingers going like this, it's traveling forward. But if you just look in this plane, what you see is a circle. And that circle's either going like that or it's going like that. So the tip, we, we describe it in terms of a vector, an electric field vector, which rotates around. That would have looked so good if we were filming in 3D. Oh, it would have looked really <laughs> good, yes. But it's the, same, it's the same principle, so you can have left and right circularly polarised. Like, you might argue... But, but what does this now look like? So, so what that, well, that, you, you... It's getting tricky, Brady, because what you have to do to convert circular... What you do is you take that circularly polarised light and you convert it to linear polarised light and then you use the same approach. Where right. does the conversion happen? The conversion happens here. You've basically got, within the glasses, you've got, um, you've got the polarizer, but you've also got something that converts that circularly polarized light to linearly polarized light. So Why are you adding uh, that layer of complexity then? What? Because for various reasons, I'm not gonna go into here, um, unless we want to make an hour long video, uh, you, there's various advantages to having circularly polarized light in terms of the ability to move your head around, to keep the, the depth, um, while you have your head at different angles, which you don't get from linear polarization. But these are really amazing. It's, I'm going to do something that I've never done before in a 60 Symbols video. I'm going to invite you, Brady, to come to the toilet with me. I've told you about circular polarization. Now, one of the remarkable things with mirrors is that a mirror will convert right circularly polarized light, so light that's going, say, this direction, into the other direction. So when, it, when that uh, light which is polarized in a particular um, handedness, as we call it, right or left, hits the mirror, it gets converted from right-handed to left-handed. Now, so that's really amazing because now when we look at these, and I advise you to do this at home, it's really quite, quite neat, and I'll certainly be bringing these home and doing it with, um, showing it to my daughters this evening. Um, you put it in front of the mirror, and what you can see is that as you go from this eye to this eye, that it appears black. So looking down through it, you can see, so in this case now, the one on the left is black, the one on the right you can see through. If we now move over to this one, one on the right is black and the other one you can see through. What the hell is going on there? So the light is coming from all the lights in here, it's bouncing off my face and it's striking the mirror and then it's coming back and hitting me. So what's happening here is that the light comes down, strikes my face, bounces off my face, goes through this thing, right? Now, initially, all that light is randomly polarized. It's got right and left circularly polarized. However, remember, this thing acts as a filter. So it, it, it makes sure that only light with a particular polarization state can get through. This is where it gets really clever. So it comes through, goes through here. That light has got a particular polarization state, which this one has let through, let's say right-handed, strikes the mirror, the mirror changes its polarization state, so it comes back and, oh dear, I can't get through. 
because I've now got the opposite polarization state, which is really quite clever. So it's a really nice example of, um, fun well, you can look at it in two ways, classical physics, quantum physics, but quantum physics at the movies, basically. It's a really, really um, clever example of, of polarization, I think. And um, I'm blown away by this type of technology. It's, it's, it's really quite neat. We could perhaps go into 3D television, but that's a different type of technology, which maybe we'll leave to another day. <laughs>